Shanna. It's pretty bad. And I'm on disability. I can definitely handle dirt. I don't have a problem with that. Wow. Hoarders is a show all about people that hoard stuff. Duh. <laughs> Hoarding disorder is real and has a complex interface with other mental illnesses like OCD and depression and quite a diverse risk profile. Clips from this episode came up on social media for me recently so I thought I'd delve into the episode in full. We're going to use this to learn all about this condition of hoarding disorder but we're going to watch this with kindness and compassion not with voyeurism. Warning though there can be some graphic content about sort of various types of contamination but I've tried to limit some of that aspect of it because it's not really necessary to talk about the mental illness side and at, at the end of the day it's the reality of this condition. I think we're going to learn a lot on this one so ready? Let's crack on. So compulsive hoarding is a mental disorder marked by an obsessive need to acquire and keep things even if the items are worthless, hazardous or unsanitary. Kind of, I don't like the use of the word obsessive though. I would much rather they use the word compulsive. Obsession is a thought process, compulsion is a behaviour and hoarding as an act and as a behaviour could be driven by lots of different things. Obsessions in the context of OCD being just one. Hoarding disorder is a standalone diagnosis in both the DSM-5 and the ICD-11. It is placed in the obsessive compulsive or related disorders chapter and we'll come on to more about this relationship between hoarding disorder and OCD as the video progresses but the definitions used for hoarding disorder in both manuals are pretty similar. Persistent difficulties with discarding or parting with possessions regardless of their actual value so not saving them and discarding them causes enormous distress so then people accumulate lots of stuff which then creates quite complicated risks that again we're going to talk about as this video goes on and quite a broad impairment in your day-to-day -day functioning. So it's not just the accumulation of items, it's not just the act, it's the distress caused by not accumulating them and the perceived normality of this behaviour, that's what makes it a mental illness. Look deeper than just the behaviour. Yeah, you see, you've used the word compulsive, good. 3 million. Do you think that's a lot? As you can imagine, people who hoard rarely leave the house. They tend to live very socially isolated lives. So many people are hoarding in secret and either never come to the attention of services or by the time they do, things are very, very extreme. That makes it very difficult to accurately estimate the prevalence of hoarding disorder worldwide. One meta-analysis has estimated it to affect approximately 2.5% of the population. That's one in 40 people. To me, that's huge. And what we also know is it's more common in older people, particularly over the age of 60. My name is Shanna. It's pretty bad. And I'm on disability. I can definitely handle dirt. I don't have a problem with that. Wow. You know, hoarding can be dangerous, not just to you, but also to the people that live around you. There are risks to your own health, a high prevalence of comorbid mental health conditions. There is the physical health risks to do with infection and contamination and vermin. Then there's risks to your own safety. For example, look at how many falling and trip hazards there are. And perhaps the biggest and most worrisome risk, because it affects everybody in the neighborhood, is the fire risk. That's all kindling. And when fires start, they're not predictable as to where they go and to what extent it endangers other people. I can't imagine there's a functioning smoke alarm in that place. And even if a fire was to start, how on earth are you going to escape? There was an anonymous neighbor who looked over the fence and saw the outside. That's how it often comes to uh, services attention. Cleaned up and turned her in. One of the defining features of what makes hoarding a mental disorder is how normalised it is for that person. Because it's normal, they're not going to ask for help, either because they don't see it as a problem or for some people there's a sense of embarrassment about how bad things have gotten. Refusing help then causes strained relationships with family. They might give up on trying to help this person and back away. That contributes to the social isolation even more. So it's often the impact that people's hoarding has on others either on family and on neighbours that triggers services then getting involved. It will usually start through the local councils because of the environmental hazards and then by the time they come and see the true extent of it and meet the individual that's living there might get mental health services involved as well. $250 a day is a lot. I'm Sean and Shanna is my sister. 
I don't think anything would honestly change if it wasn't for the city posting a thing on the door. So added to the risk profiles is the financial consequences and potentially criminal consequences of not adhering to these notices that the government and the local authority are giving you. It's a very oversimplistic approach though because it purely sees this as a problematic behaviour, almost implying people are just doing this because they're lazy and therefore if there's an incentive or the risk of a punishment in some way they can change, right? Just like that. It's really oversimplistic and we need to step back and think about the thoughts and the emotional states that drive this behaviour because they can be very different. And if you don't change what drives it, then as soon as this place is cleared up, it will just happen again. But Shanna's been living dirty. Wow. Wow. For a long time. Sorry if you've not got a particularly strong stomach. The this is like really kicked in when she moved in with my mom. This is interesting. There was like two orders in the pod. We've talked about this concept of heritability on previous videos. So what proportion of your risk of developing this condition is dictated by genetic risk factors rather than environmental ones? We've mostly talked about it in relation to neurodevelopmental conditions like autism and ADHD and a bit on schizophrenia as well, where the heritability is estimated to be around 80-85%, really high. Genetics are much more important than environmental risk factors for those conditions. The heritability for hoarding disorder is less than 50%. So the risk is more to do with environmental risk factors than genetic ones that both play a part. Interestingly, a Nature paper found more overlaps in the genetic risk profiles between hoarding disorder and schizophrenia than with conditions traditionally associated with hoarding disorder like obsessive compulsive disorder. Losing somebody takes a lot out of a person. I think it's hard because we live together and our lives were entwined with one another. Oh no, I just missed that. There's clearly an element of grief tied up in this as well. Passively living like her mum when they lived together, which has then passively continued after she's died when she's only become more isolated. And maybe continuing to live like this is a way of on a deeper level, feeling still attached to her mum. More isolation though means it continues to go unchallenged, it continues to be normalised as all she knows. Shanna has been abandoned and isolated due to mom's death. Shanna says she's okay. I think it's affected her a lot. These cognitive distortions of normalisation and rationalisation are really our first targets for psychological treatment. But the rigidity of these defences can be so frustrating for family. How can you not see that this is not normal? And when they can't get past those walls, it leads to basically a fight and flight reaction. It either leads to conflict and the relationship breaks down or people just give up entirely. Either way, the result is the same, much more isolation. These distortions then become more entrenched because they're, again, going unchallenged. And we see how this cycle of thought patterns and behaviours perpetuates one another. This is where cognitive behaviour therapy comes in. My name is Linda, and I believe that we are at the beginning of the end times now. When the Lord comes back, the people that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will raise to be with the Lord, and that, I believe, is the rapture. I have stuff here that could be used for people who do not make the rapture. For the left behinders. So she's seeing this as an act of goodwill, as a being a good Samaritan. It will be interesting to probe into the intensity of this belief and the cause and effect, i.e. to try and trace the chronology of is the hoarding a result of this belief or has this belief essentially emerged and is now relied upon as a way of trying to rationalise and condone the behaviour, which would be more suggestive of an underlying hoarding disorder. Seems like each time that, that we try to deal with this, the situation is a little bit worse. You know, she's got a little bigger rental or a little bigger storage shed, and I guess she's kind of like an avalanche. It starts kind of small, but it just gets bigger. Just doing a clean up is going to be a very short term fix. It might address the immediate safety risks, but without catered psychological therapy, the real problem doesn't go away and it will just recur. The difficulty is the person needs to acknowledge that this is a problem that needs to change 
if psychological therapy is going to stand a chance at working. I see a fire hazard. I see a health risk. I see a situation that that shortens my mother's life every day that she's there. And he's right. And there's an argument to say that you can do what you want with your own property and arguably you can make unwise decisions that unnecessarily jeopardise your own health. Part of being human, right? We can all do what we want to do. However, you don't have the right to jeopardise the safety of others. That's the difference here. And that's why legally and morally and ethically, services have to get involved and try and enforce change if need be. If one trailer goes up in smoke, the others around it are going to go up too. Seven days into the inspection, the family must convince them to get rid of a hoard she believes I is ordained up by place, God. But I can't do anything about how she thinks about things. In number, they are like the sands of the seashore. The son here is taking such a, a, an emotionally mature perspective on this. The problem is not really the behaviour, the problem is the thought patterns that are driving the behaviour. That's what's key to any compulsive disorder. It's about the normalisation of it and the anxiety of not doing it. Do you think I meet the definition of a hoarder? Hell yes. Yes. I don't think you see this house the same that I see it. We're starting to touch on insight now, which is not an all or nothing phenomenon. When it comes to mental disorders, when we assess insight, we might start by looking at to what extent does someone appreciate that this is not how most people live. Then we might go to, do they really have any appreciation that this is causing problems? That that might be something that needs treatment, that that might be long-term treatment. You can have insight into some bits and not others. There's lots of gray area when it comes to this, but you need a little bit of insight if psychological therapy is going to stand a chance of working. Otherwise, how else are you gonna get them to sit in a room and engage with the process? I'm, I'm, I'm realizing she may not be able to make a lot of good decisions. What is the main cause of the smell? Mm. Uh, musty, uh, musty odor, having to do with mold and dust. Again, this is about insight, but be careful not to overgeneralize. Just because someone maybe lacks decision-making ability in one domain in their life doesn't mean they lack decision-making ability in all domains of their life. I'm Dr. Melva Green, a board-certified psychiatrist specializing in anxiety disorders and hoarding behaviors. Now, I understand that you've been holding on to some stuff for end of times. Is that, is that the case? Well, the end times... When you can't buy or sell the things that you need, it's going to be hard to get food, that kind of thing. Okay. I've never seen a home as bad as these two on this episode. Though I have been in many homes of people where hoarding has been a problem. For professionals watching this, some tips. Don't go in on your own. Don't go in if there's any indicator that it's not safe. If you feel your safety is threatened, you need to just leave. Whether that's because of vermin, fire risks, sharp objects around like broken glass. But providing you can do this assessment in the way that it is safe, then it starts with a conversation. My approach, and it's my approach to most assessments that I do in pretty much all aspects of psychiatry, is to start with a day in the life. What is this person's routine and where are things going well, where are things not going so well? You can then usually spot those day-to-day -day things that you can probe into and explore some of the underlying thought patterns and emotional states. And that's where your mental state examination comes in. It also means that very quickly you get an idea of how this is affecting somebody's function and you can also get a good window into some people's strengths and where things are going well rather than just focusing on all the negatives. This is a unique hoard in the sense that this is integral to her belief system. So when someone's excuse for having something is, you know, God would want me to have this. You know, you've got to argue with God. God. <laughs> yeah. Really? Exactly. You've got to try and disentangle as well. Is this just an odd belief that human beings are all entitled to have? I think people that, you know, are well into astrology. That's a weird belief. You've got to separate that from recurrent, intrusive, unwanted thought patterns like obsessions and delusions, which are fixed False beliefs held with 100% certainty despite all evidence to the contrary and are a symptom of psychosis. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and I specialize in OCD and compulsive hoarding. Never have I had a job where having you here is more crucial. <laughs> Once upon a time, people think that hoarding was exclusively a manifestation of obsessive compulsive disorder. We now know that's not true. A starting point to try and distinguish between the two are whether the behaviours are, and I'm going to introduce you to some terms that you might not have heard of before, 
egosyntonic or egodystonic. Ego is referring to our sort of core values. Egosyntonic means these behaviours and the feelings evoked are acceptable and in harmony with our values and our goals. That's what happens in hoarding disorder, where people are accumulating items they perceive as having value and the distress comes from not being able to keep hold of them. It's a behaviour that's compulsive and habitual, but the compulsion itself doesn't cause the distress. Ego dystonic is what happens in OCD. The intrusive thoughts are unwanted, they're deeply unpleasant, they're not in keeping with our values and our beliefs. People often do not want to do the compulsions, but they feel that they have no choice as this is the only way to at least temporarily try and relieve the anxiety that comes from the obsessions. The obsession leads to the anxiety. The compulsive behaviours are designed to try and undo the obsession to relieve the anxiety. There is nothing pleasurable in OCD, neither the obsessions nor the compulsions. So even if they both manifest with compulsive hoarding behaviours, the motivations for them are very different. And that's also reflected in those genetic risk factors that are quite different between hoarding disorder and OCD. This is covered in mold. It might be a little bit moldy because I don't have a freezer. So you're going to eat moldy bread? No, I'm going to pick the mold up. Much We're better. starting to hit her anxiety. The hoarder in her is coming out. Just some of that stuff I just got from the food bank. Some of it is expired, yes. Most of it probably is. Shanna? Having the items isn't the source of the anxiety. It's the notion of getting rid of them. All of this stuff seems to spark joy. This is where cognitive behavioural therapy can be really good, both at trying to formulate exactly where the anxiety is, by mapping out how thoughts, the feelings, the physical sensations and behaviours all link into one another, because that means you can then cater your treatment, usually either targeting the thought patterns directly or targeting the behaviours that in turn hopefully will start to entrain more helpful thought patterns. I sense that you're angry. Yep. Tell me what you're angry about. My mom died of cancer in this hellhole and no one cared till now. He felt like he had tried to help Shanna for years. He was angry with Nola, feeling like she hadn't done anything to help. And Nola could have and said, hey, the house is getting here. dirty. Let's do something about it. She's, she's the one that helped me get the garbage service started back up again. This is almost like a family therapy approach. We need a greater availability of family therapy in general for mental disorders because pretty much every single mental illness that I can think of has a impact on family and family have an impact on it. And there's really good evidence for family therapy in depression, anxiety, eating disorders, schizophrenia, but people think it's too costly. Dunno. I've never quite understood why we don't make it more widely available. But she didn't want it. She refused it. So what could you do about it? Your I didn't see anybody high. try. It's a good point though. No one's done sh I'm the only person that's offered to help clean this place before. What can you do if that person refuses? Very difficult. You know, in the UK, we have the Mental Health Act. Can't really foresee a situation where that could be used to section somebody on the grounds of hoarding disorder because at the end of the day, the treatment is long-term psychological therapy. Therapy needs willed engagement. You don't have to be completely insightful because therapy is designed to help improve your insight. But... You need to have enough to at least think that maybe sitting in the room and talking about it with the professionals is a sensible idea. And I, I'm going to go ahead and eat some of the contaminated food and then the party's over. Because I have to get it because when somebody goes on she wants one last hurrah. they want to get high one last time. The party ends for me tomorrow. With everything that we've learned now about different thought patterns driving this hoarding behaviour, are we starting to see why hoarding disorder is distinct from OCD? OCD, there is no pleasure whatsoever. Here, she's getting something out of it. The behaviour is in keeping with her values and her core beliefs, whether those are rationalised and normalised beliefs or not. This behaviour creates pleasure rather than being used purely to try and ward off some anxiety brought on by an obsessive thought pattern. She wants one last hurrah. You guys are only going to be here a couple of days and then you're going to leave like you've done your job or taken care of the problem. And you have it. You've done two little rooms and you've talked to Linda a little bit. The daughter-in-law's there and she is just going off on us. She has a big problem here that you guys were going to help with. Are you a professional in this? Have you ever done this before? Yeah, for 17 okay, years. So I go around the country training people on hoarding. Yeah. Okay. We clean out entire houses all How the time. How do you do it? It's up to the hoarder. We're trying to work with Linda through the process so she doesn't go back to this hoarding situation as soon as we're gone. If Debbie wants a clean house, she should have come here and done it herself before we arrived. Speaking of the last hurrah, this interaction reminds me of something I commonly see when addiction is the core complaint, where families might bring people in and they just go to professionals, they just need some help, you just need to help them. Almost hoping that we can just detain people in hospital and there is 
an equivalent of an antipsychotic that we can just force people to have that will resolve the condition. It reflects the fear and the helplessness that so many family members are feeling. And that can easily get taken out on professionals around them when you can't immediately soothe that. Because we can't do it for people. We can open the door and support people once they walk through. I know I'm like a broken record, but I go back, there has to be some degree of world engagement. So when he says it's up to the hoarder, to an extent he's right. Well, tell I'm me angry at you guys. I'm you don't want to clean up that. Excuse what's, us what's just a minute. Debbie, can... relax, all right? Linda is the problem. She's not allowing stuff to be thrown Troy, away. Troy, have you seen this? Deb, do not talk to me like that. I've been here all day. I have seen this. We're doing everything that Linda's letting us do at this point, and for her to show up this late in the game and try to direct the show, sorry, it's not going to happen. Everybody needs to step back, reflect a bit, don't get caught up in a power play between professionals and family. Nobody wins. My greatest concern is what's going to happen when we leave. Yeah. Cognitive behavioural therapy is the first line treatment. Medication don't work. There's no evidence for that in hoarding disorder, though please keep an eye out for those comorbidities that could benefit from treatment. Comorbid depression and OCD and anxiety disorders, for example. The CBT techniques used are usually more cognitive ones than behavioural ones, focusing on the rationalisation and the normalisation of this behaviour and using techniques like motivational interviewing to try and overcome these. We talked about that particular type of therapy when we watched Euphoria. It's widely used in addiction. We also need to address the, the patterns of attachment that people have put to these items that they're accumulating and the sort of sentimentality that people hold towards them. The stories on here, pretty extreme, but I hope going through this video has helped us to try and understand this condition a little bit more and where the mental health aspect sits in what is a very real disorder, a hoarding disorder. But let me know what you thought in the comments below and any other ideas of content that I should look at. Love you, bye.